Hello, art historians, and welcome to our first of a few lectures over the art of medieval Europe. So in this time period that we've been looking at, we've kind of been talking about this post-classical time period. And what that is, is where we're going to see the continuation of classical belief systems and the art and architecture that will go with them. And we'll also see the rise of new belief systems during that time that will kind of um, adopt and adapt with other belief systems. So for example, Islam, which was kind of a branch off of um, you know, monotheistic faiths and kind of like this new monotheistic faith, but they did adopt a lot of classical ideas, especially from the Greeks and Romans that they got from the Byzantines. Now, Europe is going to be a little bit different because when we talk about Europe during this time, people refer to it as medieval Europe or the Middle Ages, meaning it's between the time of the fall of Rome and the Renaissance, where it's just the rebirth or bringing back basically of Greece and Rome. So what we're going to start to see happen here in Europe is that they go into a period where it truly is a middle age between two periods or a dark age because in terms of intellectual rational learning there wasn't a whole lot going on there was some but it wasn't accessible to the average individual to the average individual person they're just trying to survive so the one classical thing that is really going to continue after the fall of Rome is going to be the belief system of Christianity which is really going to impact art of Europe until they reach the Renaissance. So again, why do we call it the Dark Ages? Because basically all the learning and advancement that you know the Greeks and the Romans had been doing was gone. And Rome was the light of the world. It provided everything for everyone in the European empire that they controlled, and now Rome was gone. And it was a scary, scary place in Europe. People were really just trying to survive. And instead of, you know, having the Roman government to protect them, they are gonna find the first person that can protect them and you know, basically work for them in exchange for protection. And what that's gonna turn into is Europe is really gonna be cut off from the rest of the world. They're not involved in trade networks. In fact, the only group really involved in trade in Europe is gonna be the Vikings, which the Europeans paint as such barbarians, but they were the ones who were in connection with the Byzantine Empire and who will eventually settle and become what we know as Russia or the Rus. It's also, again, the Middle Ages because it's in between those two time periods in European history. But please do remember that nowhere else in the world was having this moment, all right? Everybody else was doing just fine. So what is it that characterizes medieval Europe? Well, really it's Christianity. That's what makes it post-classical is that's what's going to continue on. The belief system of Christianity will remain and really be the only thing that gave people in Europe hope um, after the Roman Empire collapsed. And the Pope basically becomes like, we call this Christendom because basically it was a kingdom of Christians united together under the Pope because no matter who was king of a particular territory, they were loyal to the church because the church could tell the average person that God approves of this king or not. So a king is king of his kingdom. The Pope is over all Christians, including kings. And because we don't have the Romans anymore, we are gonna see this system of feudalism, which doesn't really apply to us in terms of art history, but it's really this idea of the fact that people in Europe were really just living on these feudal manors. They very rarely traveled outside their time. The church was really their main source of hope and provider of charity and medical care. And then they had the Lord of the land that they were living on and that Lord protected them in exchange for work. So at no point is anybody gonna have the time or the incentive to really be involved in art or architecture unless you were working for the church. And even then the church would dictate how art was going to look. So after Rome falls, Europe is really up for grabs. Like nobody really controls it. Um, there's all these people who are running around very lost. And we start to see the migration period where all of these different, what the Romans would have called barbarian groups because of the way that they talked. They said their language sounded like bar, bar, bar to them. So therefore they thought that they were, you know, barbarians. These groups like Goths and Franks and Vandals and Vikings, all of these groups started migrating into Europe and when this happened, they did sometimes bring in their own belief systems with them and their own art and architectural styles. For example, the Vikings were extremely good with metalworking and melting down um, pieces of glass to form enamel, which was something that people looked at and were like, wow, that's really beautiful. So kind of like an influence for stained glass, if you will. But these groups coming in, whenever they settled in Europe, if they really wanted to get 
the approval of their people that they were going to rule over, the best thing that they could do is adopt Christianity because then they could get the approval of the Pope who's like, yes, we approve of this person. God approves of this ruler. So if you're loyal to this person, then you're loyal to the church. And then basically the kings become second to the church. So you can see here, this is the insanity after Rome falls. Like the East Roman Empire is the Byzantine Empire, which was very well protected. Um, they were doing just fine, but everywhere else, you're gonna see just tons and tons and tons of these Germanic groups. One of the, which is really gonna be very important are the Franks, which will establish what we know as Fran you know, France today. And here they come. And basically these rulers start taking over this land and say, hey, listen, I will give away some of my land to you lords your lords, you can make the laws in your land, you can collect some of the taxes, everybody on the land can work for you, but your job is to provide me with a military when I need it and to take care of these people and you get all the perks of it. And the way that they got that right to rule was again by basically going to the church and saying, can I have the right to rule in the church saying yes. So again, I can't emphasize enough that what makes Europe post-classical during this time is that full embrace of Christianity because really that's all that was left. Rome was gone. The Christian church was basically all people had to look to for laws and charity and hope. Basically the same thing that Buddhism was to China after the Han dynasty collapsed. The churches and especially the monasteries where the monks lived and the nuns lived, those were those communities that could provide food and medical care and hope and study of religious doctrine because nobody would touch those monasteries. It was like the safe zone in playing tag. Like you didn't want to mess with those because they were protected by God. So therefore those monasteries and those religious communities are gonna be one of the main places where art is created. And that art is really gonna be with the purpose of reinforcing Christianity. So that kind of leads us to one of our major art forms of medieval Europe, and that's gonna be the illuminated manuscripts. Now remember, we've already seen this in the Islamic world. We saw it in the Byzantine Empire with um, the Vienna Genesis. We've seen it with the Persian Empire and the Persian miniatures. We've seen Islamic illuminated manuscripts, which remember, if it was the Quran, you would not have pictures in it. It could be decorated with like gold and things like that, but definitely not pictures. So because Europe is so illiterate, right, and we have all of these different groups coming in that speak all of these different languages, and there's these efforts to convert them because basically more Christians equals more power to the Pope, these illuminated manuscripts were incredibly important because they basically were able to provide a visual to people who were highly illiterate. So these manuscripts, manus, mean like our mandibles, that's your hand, and scriptus is to write. So these were handwritten texts, and the only place that would have been even remotely safe enough to do these would be in these religious communities. And these manuscripts written by hand would be so incredibly valuable, and they would be worked on by somebody would do the writing, somebody would do the picture, somebody would do the calligraphy in them, or the, you know, basically the decoration around the side. And the idea was that these illuminated manuscripts would almost illuminate, you know, light up the people who were reading them and bring the beauty of God to them, basically. So the exterior beauty of the books reflect the interior beauty or the spirituality of the words. And because to do the, okay, you're trying to convert people, all right, to Christianity. To create an entire Bible was going to take forever, and you need these to be able to travel around and get people to convert. So typically what they would do is do the Gospels. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament of the Bible, which all talked about um, Jesus's life. So they would usually do these books in, you know, just the four chapters so that those could be carried around and used to tell the stories that would lead to conversion. Um, so the illuminated manuscripts, you've probably actually seen, and noticed the pictures in these are much bigger. So in other areas of the world, so for example, we saw in the Vienna Genesis, there's a lot more words. People were a lot more literate. Islamic Empire, they don't really need pictures in the Quran because everybody was able to read, including women, because that was a requirement to read the Quran. The Persian manuscripts will have the calligraphy around it and the pictures, but in these, the pictures are a much, much bigger deal. So this is one of the things that was very common, and I do need to reinforce this, is that they wanted to make the Bible and the scenes very accessible to people so that they could relate to it. So one common thing that they would do is do scenes from the Bible, but they would do them appearing to happen in modern times. 
because that way people could connect with it better. They, they could see themselves in it, essentially. So, like, for example, this is the conversion of St. Paul, who apparently fell off a horse and then had this, you know, incredible conversion and, you know, changed to suddenly following Jesus when he hadn't before. And if you look at it, it's knights on horseback in European armor, and that's not something that, that didn't happen. Like, they didn't have that kind of armor. This looks like something that happened in the 1400s or 1300s, but it actually was telling a story from way back, you know, in the early centuries. So, or, you know, CE. So can you can see here, this was very common, this practice of, they didn't think people were smart enough to kind of imagine the past or visualize it. So they kind of put these old stories in modern times. In fact, if you've ever seen the movie Sleeping Beauty at the very beginning of it, that's actually an illuminated manuscript. You can see the exterior of it was always very um, elaborate and decorated with jewels and things like that. That was very common. That metal work was actually something they got from the Vikings, actually. So you can see big pictures and not a whole lot of words. And this opening of Sleeping Beauty is basically an illuminated manuscript. So, again, whenever you would see these um, in, in early Middle Ages, to get an entire book of the Bible was pretty difficult. So they really like to focus on those first four books of the New Testament, the Gospels, or the Good News, which is, you know, telling the story of Jesus and his death. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these were called the Evangelists, right, which is a Greek word. And so during the Roman times, um, whenever they would have to hide these stories, you know, basically in plain sight, they would use symbols for them. But then they eventually became to be universally recognized as the gospel. So, for example, Mark is always a lion. Luke is an ox. John is an eagle. And Matthew is shown as an angel or man. Because in case you didn't know, the name Matthew means gift from God, which I know because that's my brother's name. I got Lauren, which means destined for victory, like crowned with laurel leaves from Rome. My brother got gift from God. So if you ever need to remember that Matthew is the angel, that's how you can remember it. Not that I'm bitter. All right. So where we're going to see some of these amazing illuminated manuscripts that really do show a combination. And this is why they picked this for the 250 is there were illuminated manuscripts everywhere that there were monasteries in Europe. And there were a lot of those religious communities because they were basically safe zones. However, and, and kings would sometimes pay for those to like get on the church's good side and they wouldn't have to pay taxes either, which was a benefit. So there are going to be places where Christianity will get to them, but when Christianity gets to them, they've already got their own belief system and an art style that goes with it. So we see some manuscripts that they've picked for the 250 that really do show that combination. And one of these really good examples we're going to see in Ireland and England. So basically on the islands that are away from England. Okay. So Rome had never actually physically conquered the island of Ireland, which means that they weren't fully exposed to the Roman art and architecture, right? So when Christianity does get there, I mean, the Pope didn't even care about Ireland for a very long time. Like it didn't even matter until England got them. But Ireland um, does be, I mean, you know, Irish Catholic, like very, very Christian, but they had their own art style and this own nature-based belief system being an island. We've seen that before. That's very common in places like Japan. Um, but they they really kind of had their own style already, and they do adopt Christianity, but a lot of their manuscripts you would look at and go, that doesn't look Christian at all. You can't even really tell it's Christian unless you know what it is. All right, so when we talk about manuscripts you're um, in this area, you'll hear the name Hibernia, which is what they call Ireland. So it's an ancient name for Ireland. And if you're talking about Hiberno-Saxon, you're talking about art of basically the British Isles. Okay, so it's like Saxony the British, and then the Hibernians, all right? So Britain was conquered physically by the Romans, and the, like Hadrian's Wall was built in England, and you had the Roman baths. So they were already exposed to Roman art. They not only you know accepted the belief system, they accepted the art that went with it, all right? So their works are known as insular, okay, which, you know, is basically after the Romans, all right, because it kind of, you know, adopts that Roman style, all right? So... Just to show you guys where Christianity will spread to, just to kind of give you guys an idea of this, largely Christianized, all right? And then here's the boundary, all right, of Roman. 
power, like basically up here across the top. That's where Hadrian's Wall was. All right, and this is the Hiberno-Saxon kind of flag that you can see here. Okay, now this area, the Celtic, all right, so kind of looking at, when we talk about Celtic, this is what we mean, all right? So like the Celtic countries, whenever you hear that referred to, okay? Because they were, and some people say that the, they were, the Romans were scared of them. And if you've ever seen Braveheart, you can kind of understand why, all right? Um, but they had kind of gotten away from, like, the insanity of Rome falling. They weren't really affected by it. So they had kind of the time to really, once they adopted Christianity, to create some of these incredibly beautiful works of art, um, some within religious communities, some of them not. And based on their location, they had interactions with Vikings, uh, Romans, Christians, all different kinds of people. And we're going to see this very eclectic and mixing style of art. Um, so what you're not going to see is anything that looks Greco-Roman. Like a lot of these works of art that we're going to look at, the, uh, you know, illuminated manuscripts, you wouldn't see nudity like you'd see in the Vienna Genesis. It doesn't really tell a story altogether, no sexuality, um, and very, very, this is a very important one, is nature-based because these people had a very strong attachment to nature, like the Celtics, the Druids, the idea of Christmas trees, all of that kind of came from this area. It's like kind of a magical, mystical area, all right? So if you look at this right here and you didn't know any better, you would probably have zero idea that this is a religious work of art, but it is. It's actually very highly religious. And the Celtic islands, and this could come from contact with Vikings, it, you know, because the Vikings were very good at small works of art because they had to be portable because the Vikings moved around and the Vikings were fighters. So they were very good with metal. What they were very good with is bending metal into shapes and then melting down glass into enamel and then filling it in in a liquid form within like almost the, the tracing of those metal works. And it would create these beautiful enamel and metal Kind of works and that may have been where this style comes from because you can kind of see it looks like especially over here in this section you can see like it almost looks like silver melted down and then like red glass or rubies melted into it but you can also see there's so many intricate interlocking patterns and that has to do with that nature-based religion of the celtic islands that everything is interlocking and interconnected all together so that's why if you've ever seen a celtic cross right that looks like this so yes, it's a cross, all right, that is Christian, but the patterns on it, the interlocking and everything being connected in nature and in life, that pattern is very Celtic in nature. And the circle that connects that is kind of that eternity altogether. They also love including animals and kind of spirits, like nature spirits that were put in there sometimes with like symbolic messages involved. Right. And we see again, just like we saw in the Incas and the Shaveen, that horror vacui, like that fear of empty space where everything is just kind of filled up and kind of continuing on. And the Islamic world kind of had that, too, because like it's that idea of seven being innumerable, that the heavens are innumerable. And seven was just a number to kind of show that. So it just keeps going. Those patterns just keep continuing. Kind of the same idea here with the pagan culture of these Celtic islands. So these are just examples here of Celtic crosses that you would see. So this is the Book of Kells, all right? And this is not one you have to know for the 250, but this is a really good example of a huge combination of cultures. So you can see it's Christian because the function of this was a gospel. How do we know that? Because it's got the symbols of the angel, the ox, the lion, um, and the man. So angel, ox, lion, and eagle all here in this. But if you look around it, it's got that appearance of that metal work, so almost like framed. And then within that are those interlocking continual patterns of vegetation and animals and all those things hidden into it. So just from looking at this, I mean, if you didn't know any better, you probably wouldn't think that this was a page in an illuminated manuscript. Like you wouldn't think that this is something that is Christian. But again, it is. All right. And hidden in this, all right, so in the Book of Kells, you can see here that, like, for example, they've put animals in here. So, like, 
the rats represent and rats and you think about it in the you know real world if you're an agricultural community rats are a threat because they can eat crops and here they are eating the communion wafer which would be made of bread and then they are standing on the cats who are meant to like protect them but they actually can't like they're actually fooling the cats and remember cats were sacred in egypt because they protected the crops from mice same thing all right so kind of the same idea here Okay, so you can see here, these are all cover pages of the different Gospels, and in no way, shape, or form does it identify that these are Gospels, but they very much look like those nature patterns, and everything is very linear and straight-lined. So, you know, straight line makes a straight soul, like everything needs to be orderly and geometric. This is the exterior of, you know, one of these illuminated manuscripts, and you can see that even that exterior has that illuminated manuscript, but it also has these jewels and elaborate coverings on it, and it almost looks like that Viking metalwork again. So we're going to take a look at the Lindisfarne Gospels, which are the ones they want you to know for the 250. Okay, so they kind of mentioned this, but during these Viking raids, okay, um, Eadfrith, who was the one who created this book, was kind of stuck on this island, um, and he had, didn't have access to a lot of the things that he would need to do to create it. So he actually is credited with creating the pencil in order to create this because they couldn't really make it out of paint. He didn't have the access to the materials at the time. Um, so he used local materials to make over 90 different colors and then used gold illumination in it. So you can see where Lindisfarne is. So it's kind of like right in that area of Viking invasions. So the Lindisfarne Gospels is the one that they want you to know um, for the 250, and it is considered Hiberno-Saxon. So it is not Irish, it is not English, it is not Viking. It is a combination of all of those. So let's look at what, let's break this down. All right, so it is a Christian manuscript. All right, so that came from Rome. It has Latin writing in it originally because the English would have adopted Latin. It has um, an English translation into it, so that is not the same as the Romans, that is English. 
And then you're going to have in it these beautiful Celtic designs that show that Hibernian um, influence on it. And then on top of that, you have that appearance of almost being like the Viking metal working designs that were on it. And it had to be perfect because this is the words of God. So therefore, it's very meticulously ruled. It's very straight edged, very similar to what we see with, you know, um, Islamic calligraphy. They would have so vellum that they mentioned in it is a hundred is made of calf skin, it's like baby cows, and they would have had to kill 130 calves, like sacrificing in order to make this. So it basically was a work of sacrifice. So this is the exterior of it, and you can see how absolutely beautiful this is with these stones and everything that adorn it on the outside. And that's why the Vikings wanted it. The Vikings could really care less that it was Christian, they just thought it was really cool. So if you look here, you can see these little translations that are written into it to be English so that people could understand it because most people couldn't speak or read Latin at this time. And you have that horror vacui and those nature-based patterns and interlocking, you know, knots, basically, if you will, and those vegetative patterns that are Hibernian. So you have English and then you have the original translation in Latin. And this is Christian because this is a cover page of one of the Gospels. Okay, and you can see just how detailed this is right here and just how tiny and small all of this would be. So they call this translation um, a gloss, right? Because it basically like glosses over it, right? To create this. Okay, so for the um, uh, Lindisfarne Gospels, there are a couple different pages they're gonna expect you to know. And I haven't yet seen this come up in a major way on the AP exam, so I'm not entirely 100% sure. My guess would be it would be a 30-minute essay, and it would have to be comparing different illuminated manuscripts. That's just my thought. So this is one page of the Lindisfarne Gospels, and these were pretty common in every single um, illuminated manuscript that was Hiberno-Saxon, and that's the insipid page. So the insipid is actually the opening words, so kind of like the opening page of this gospel. So this one needed to be very elaborate because it was the opening of it. So right here, you have the opening words in Latin of St. Luke's Gospel, but then you can see the gloss in it of the red and the words above it, which were the English translation. And then you can see the kind of metalwork influence of the, especially in this over here, where you can see that it's kind of that metalwork and then filled in in the center of it with patterns and jewels and things like that. And then you definitely have the Celtic influence of all the nature patterns that are in there. So again, the bottom corner has a cat who has eaten birds, right? So cats are the protectors. They ate mice and birds that could destroy the crops. And then the Celtic tradition, the mice, the mice were not good, right? Because they could destroy, you know, basically your lifestyle. All right, so this is the St. Luke's portrait page, right? So you've got the um, first, the opening page, right? So the opening words, and then you have, this is a common thing in Roman books. So this is something they would have kept on from Roman times. And you can see here that he's wearing a toga. So he's dressed in Roman style. He has halos around his head. So it is the symbol for him. And that's something that would have been Greco-Roman in influence. You can see it's not 100% realistic. They weren't really going for naturalism. So that's kind of the same lines as the Byzantine Empire. Like we don't want it looking too naturalism. So they're really breaking away from Roman in that. His feet aren't really grounded very much. But you can see the Latin and then, of course, the English translation in it. And then up in the corners, you've got that Celtic influence in the style. All right, so... This is um, this one's not St. Luke's over here. You can see this is actually St. Matthew that's here on the right. Um, but you can kind of see that that was the tradition. And because the English had been ruled by the Romans, they would have been familiar with this practice of putting a portrait page in the actual book. So this is St. Luke's portrait page that we kind of already talked about. So um, he's shown writing this actual gospel he's shown with a greek style beard which remember in the roman empire hadrian um, who was ruler whenever like they had england and was a very big fan of greece that's why the pantheon has the greek temple front on the front of it he's the one that started wearing that big thick beard because it basically implied that you were so busy thinking you didn't have time to shave plus it could show age and wisdom and maturity that you know what you're talking about as an author so this is what we call the cross carpet page, 
right, of the Lindisfarne Gospels. And why? Because A, it looks like a cross on it, and then it also has what appears to be a carpet style. And there's actually a theory that this may have been influenced, even though it's definitely got that Hiberno-Saxon and Viking look to it, may have been influenced by this point of them interacting with the Islamic world and seeing some of those carpets that they would have had, which were kind of similar to this. Now, this one's actually the one from the book of Matthew, but a cross carpet page is a cross carpet page. Like you would be able to pick this out. Um, so kind of like the image of a prayer rug, kind of. And there's actually a belief that this may have been a Celtic, Celtic tradition, that all of these patterns would have protected like magically the words inside. So it was almost like a covering to like protect it and hide it. Um, so really kind of mixing all of these together. So Christian, um, English, except not really on this page because there's not many much of the English translation. Um, the Viking metal work that looks like it is on there. Um, and then possibly the access to the Persian world and seeing the Persian carpets. So this is kind of another example of a cross carpet page. All right, so we are going to stop there and next we will move into the mainland of Europe and see how they are going to combine Christianity with on the mainland of Europe, they're really going to try to do this revival um, of the Roman Empire in a way. And so we're going to see a lot more of the Roman tradition really coming through on mainland Europe.